everybody, and thank you for joining us today for our webcast, Renovate Your E-Commerce Presence Today. My name is Rob Lunder from the Edge by Essential Marketing Department, and we're very excited today to be joined by Mark Gilroy, Head of Brand Partnerships with ChannelSight, and my colleague Chris Elliott, Senior Insight Analyst with Edge by Essential. Uh, all participants are on mute for the call today, but if you do have any questions, you can ask them by entering them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will do our very best to get to all of your questions today, and if we're unable to do so due to time, cons time constraints, we'll make sure to follow up with you after the webcast to respond to you directly. Today's webcast is brought to you today by Edge by Essential, formerly Brandview, Clavis Insight, One Click Retail, and Planet Retail RNG. Our four companies have joined forces under Essential PLC, with a shared vision to empower brands and retailers with the most comprehensive, accurate, and actionable insights and advisory solutions to go revenue in an e-commerce driven marketplace. We partner globally with the world's leading brands and retailers to identify strategies and to provide weekly, daily, and real-time digital shelf performance KPIs, including pricing, promotions, availability, traffic, conversion, sales, and share. Today's webcast is also brought to you today by Channel Site, uh, founded in 2013, Channel Site is on a mission to make the world instantly shoppable. They make it simpler and faster for people to buy the products they're interested in, and they show brands and publishers what content and ads are working most uh, working most effectively to drive sales across all digital channels. Mark Gilroy, uh, again head of brand partnerships for Channel Site, um, is leading uh, the presentation today. Mark, uh, can you just share uh, with everybody a little bit more about Channel Site and um, what's uh, what's new with you guys? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for that, Rob. Um, you, you kind of summed it up very well there. Um, so kind of in a, in a nutshell, I guess, uh, channel side, you know, as a we're a where to buy provider, um, which essentially means we're really looking to kind of capture, you know, high intent consumers, you know, across your entire or any of your digital, you know, touch points and kind of funnel them through to a point of sale with um, one of your uh, e-retail partners. Um, and then on top of that, you know, we look to kind of track and measure um, and give brands uh, back that visibility into exactly which touch point is driving the highest amount of leads, but then equally kind of what's actually driving, you know, uh, revenue for the brand. Um, so that's pretty much it. Thanks, Rob. Great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, again, that's Mark Gilroy. He is the head of brand partnerships at Channel Site, uh, working with brands in, uh, Mark works with brands in the DIY and homeware space to drive their e-commerce capabilities and connect through to retailers with high purchase intent. Uh, also uh, leading today's call is Chris Elliott, uh, again, Senior Insight Analyst uh, here with Edge by Essential. Chris has been our prolific Insight Analyst for over four years and leads our Insight sub team, combining incoming requests and trending topics. Chris focuses on the, US, on the UK and US and is adept at taking vast quantities and varieties of data and boiling it down into actionable insight. I'd now like to turn it over to Chris who will kick off today's presentation. Chris, over to you. Thank you very, very much for that, Rob and Mark. Uh, good afternoon slash morning, depending on where you are, everyone. Uh, so today I will be giving you an overview of the DIY market in the US and the UK from a sales and growth perspective, uh, with also a touch on how the promotional landscape has looked like uh, over the last six months uh, before handing back to Mark. So here I'll be starting out with the US, where we all know really that Home Depot and Lowe's are the two biggest players in the market, uh, with a combined revenue of $170 billion in 2018 alone. Now, over the last 12 months, it has appeared that Home Depot has stolen a bit of a march on Lowe's, uh, returning very good sales results. Uh, also added to that was uh, the Lowe's unfortunate announcement in November that it would be closing 51 stores, uh, 20 in the US and 31 in Canada. However, in February 2019, so just six weeks ago, uh, Lowe's fought back as its comparable sales growth in its most recent figures uh, outstripped that of Home Depot, 5.8% uh, versus 4.1%. So using Edge Retail, in, uh, sorry, Edge by Essential Retail Insight, uh, we have looked at the in-store sales growth over the next five years. Uh, we've also included Menards in this as, uh, for, for a bit of an additional comparison. So the first thing to notice here is uh, actually sales growth is predicted to decline year on year uh, over the next five years. Now, because we're looking at in-store sales here, uh, this decline most likely is because of the, uh, the increase in e-commerce sales as opposed to a general flattening of the market. Now, within these figures, we can see that Home Depot is out, is predicted to outgrow uh, Lowe's and Menard. So, for instance, next year, uh, they're expecting a 5.5% increase in in-store sales compared to 4.9 for Lowe's and 3.9 for Menards. However, there is a difference in growth rates as we move on through the five-year period. And we can certainly see in 2020, 
and 2021, uh, a narrowing of the gap, particularly in 2020, uh, between it and lows. A uh, little bit of an extension again uh, in, in, in 2022, but again, a bit of a contraction in uh, 2023. Uh, so basically what we're saying here is Home Depot is predicted to outgrow lows, but that gap is narrowing. Now in the UK, we have a very different view. Uh, there's been a background, an ongoing background this year of, of uncertainty, especially with the British high street, uh, Brexit, uh, and this has obviously impacted uh, footfall. Um, obviously very publicly, this, is, this has led to uh, Toys R Us, Maplin and Poundworld uh, all, clo all closing, uh, and many of the retailers such as H HMV uh, being forced to find investment or a buyer to survive. Uh, the DIY market has not been immune to this. Uh, so uh, last year, November, uh, sorry, I think it was November, August, sorry, home base announced a com uh, company voluntary agreement, uh, which led to the shutting of 42 stores uh, and therefore a loss of uh, 1,500 jobs. Now, of course, this left the door open for Kingfisher owned B&Q and Screwfix to, uh, to, take, to plug that gap. So looking here at uh, in-store sales growth again, we actually see uh, a, a bit of a different pattern. So here we have uh, grouped Kingfisher into one. So uh, B&Q and Screwfix are, are, are Kingfisher in this analysis. Um, and again, we can see a decline in sales, uh, again, likely to, to the rise of e-commerce. Uh, and, and certainly uh, certainly in the, in the UK, footfall and in-store sales are declining. Um, but interesting, interesting what we see is that home base is actually predicted to have a greater growth rate, as we can see here, 4.3 versus 1.3 in 2019, uh, than the Kingfisher owned stores. Now, obviously, as we've just uh, said, home base didn't exactly have the greatest 2018. So this uh, increased growth rate could be a result of its turnaround plan over the next few years. So to understand uh, what has been going on in terms of promotions in the DIY market, we've chosen to look at the air and power tool category. Uh, now, we've selected this to be uh, the number of these subcategories here. So we have angle grinders, drills, impact drivers, nail and staple guns, power saws, power tool sets, powered screwdrivers, and sanders. Starting with the US, uh, we've decided to look at a period of, uh, period of time between uh, October 1st, 2018 and March 18, 2019. Uh, this means we'll be able to look at peaks over the Black Friday weekend and the rest of the holiday shopping period. So here in the US, we've decided to look at uh, Amazon, Home Depot, Lowe's, uh, and Menards. And the measures that we are looking at in terms of promotion is, is percentage of range on promotion. Uh, the reason we do this is because obviously each retailer has a different uh, range size, so therefore it sort of equalizes them against each other. Uh, and we've also looked here at average depth of cut or uh, percentage discount, depending on what nomenclature you prefer. So when we look at the percentage range on promotion, we can see that Menards actually had the greatest range on promotion throughout the whole period, except for one week where Walmart topped it. And we also see that Home Depot had quite a low uh, low percentage of range on promotion all the way throughout the period, indeed the lowest of, of the retailers analysed. And if we then move on to average depth of cut, but actually before we do that, let's have a look at the peak time. So we can actually see a, quite a peak in over the Black Friday weekend. So here we've got the, the week commencing the 19th and the week commencing the 26th, which would be Cyber Monday. Uh, we can see de definitely peaks uh, in, all, in all retailers, albeit Menards, uh, for the holiday shopping season, we can certainly see it with Walmart, we can certainly see it with Lowe's, uh, Amazon, and indeed Home Depot. And when we look at average depth of cut or percentage discount, uh, we see that Menards again uh, was quite a heavy promoter. Indeed, it had the greatest average depth of cut for 14 of the 25 weeks. Um, we also see quite a spike here uh, at the start from Lowe's where, with an average depth of cut or average percentage discount of 37%. So at this point, it was running uh, a very small number of promotions, uh, some of which had very deep discounts, therefore creating this high average. And we can see here that Amazon in the, the blue at the bottom there had the uh, lowest average discount for the majority of the period. Um, this is not, uh, this, is not this, is, this is expected. Uh, Amazon obviously worked to a different kind of promotional strategy away from the more traditional approach uh, where they have more regular price changes and, and quite a low base price to begin with. Um, so that's why their, their discounts are not as high as some others. So then looking at it from another perspective, we're going to look at it uh, by brand. So we've taken seven of the most popular sorry, six of the most popular uh, brands in the, in the US uh, across those retailers uh, and summarized by the same, the same measures of promotion. So we can actually see here that Black & Decker and Porter Cable 
had the greatest range, uh, percentage of range on promotion, uh, particularly over the Black Friday uh, weekend and the Christmas shopping season. Uh, Black & Decker were particularly high, higher, I would say, than, than Porter Cable, which, which dropped down uh, going into December. Um, and then when we look onto average depth of cut, actually we see Hitachi, uh, who in the previous slide, if we go back, had quite an average uh, amount of promotion, certainly uh, quite low towards the end. Uh, however, it did have a, a, the highest average depth of cut for the, for the start of the period uh, before it start, uh, Port of Cable started to compete going into the new year, S sort of here. Um, but we, also, we can also see in the purple here that Black & Decker had quite a high average depth of cut, uh, highlighting how it and Port of Cable were the highest promoters in the US during this period. Now, switching to the UK, the first thing that's uh, immediately noticeable is that there are significantly fewer promotions than in the US. So we can see that uh, Argos were quite a strong promoter, particularly over the uh, over the uh, over the key uh, Black Friday weekend, and before dipping down a little bit into the holiday season, uh, Screwfix obviously picked up its promotions before then declining in, in January, and we do see quite a steep decline in promotions uh, from these two retailers. Before uh, we see B and Q right at the end, really increasing promotions going into March, uh, which we'll come on to later uh, as a trend. And um, when we look at average depth of cut, we actually uh, end up looking uh, at Wix here as uh, having the uh, highest average depth of cut, um, despite actually having the almost the lowest uh, average uh, amount of promotions. Now, it's actually quite a commonly observed trend that we, we generally see across many categories, actually. Uh, we tend to find that when the number of promotions drops uh, drops a lot, then the average depth of cut rises, as traditionally what is usually left is uh, deeply discounted items. Um, and on the flip side of that, that's also true. If there's a huge increase in the number of promotions, generally speaking, uh, these are sort of 10% off or 15% off and, and therefore a lower average depth of cut. Now, before we look at the breakdown of the brands in the UK, uh, I think it's first important to speak to the difference in assortment between the UK and the US. Uh, mostly because in the UK, uh, own label has a much greater prominence than it seems to in the US, particularly in Argos and B&Q, where here it accounted in this lovely color here for almost a quarter of their entire range. However, in the US, we see a much more diverse range of brands available uh, with DeWalt, the most listed in Amazon, Home Depot and Lowe's, but with none in Menards and Walmart. Uh, Milwaukee actually being the most popular brand in Home Depot, uh, or most listed brand, sorry, uh, and Bosch in Menards. So quite a different picture to the UK. So when we look at the breakdown in terms of promotion in the UK, own label is very prominent. We can see here that it had the highest average depth of cut before Einhell, uh, sorry, percentage range on promotion before Einhell uh, took it took over during the holiday season going into, into the new year. Uh, and again, we see this quite steep drop off uh, in, in promotion in, in January, which we also saw with Bosch and we also saw with DeWalt, as well as Einhell a little bit a little bit earlier. When we look at average depth of cut, uh, we also see that own label again is, is right at the top. It's uh, one of the heavily most, most heavily discounted uh, discounted brands or sort of brands there. Now this is obviously uh, possibly expected. Uh, retailers have got a bit more control possibly over price with uh, with their own products than they uh, and margins than they do with brands. Um, but we can see that Bosch fought back here towards the end of the period, uh, matching own label. So when we speak about own label, we're obviously talking about each individual retailer's uh, own label presence. So we have actually excluded Amazon from this as they were not a significant player uh, when it came to own label. Um, and we can actually see that Screwfix and Argos had the greatest percentage of range on promotion. Uh, Argos particularly uh, around here at the start of the period, Screwfix pulling it back a little bit towards, towards December when Argos has declined. Um, and we can see this big dip in January that we referred to earlier on is really led by these two retailers. Um, so actually, if we if we summarise this, that Screwfix actually had the uh, the top spot, as it were, for 13 weeks, Argos for nine weeks, uh, and B&Q got three weeks here right at the end. Uh, again, as we've seen, they uh, they promoted quite uh, quite sharply towards the end of the period. When we look at average depth of cut, it's, it's a bit more of, a, of an, even, uh, an even fight. Um, Wix and Screwfix did lead the way towards the end of the period. You can see here very stable promotions from Wix when they had actually not that many promotions on. And then Screwfix really climbing towards the end. And again, when we say Screwfix climbing towards the end, we can see it's actually because their promotions, the number of promotions they had actually sank again, referring to the trend we observed earlier on. So I'm now going to hand back over to Mark, uh, who was now going to talk about optimizing uh, not only online, uh, sorry, uh, to optimize online, um, which will therefore increase your e-commerce sales, but also in store. Uh, over to you, Mark. 
Well, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for that, Chris. Um, some very, very interesting points. And I think it's there's definitely kind of a lot of what we're seeing, especially kind of with ourselves here in China site, that there is this, you know, um, massive kind of growth area or growth potential kind of in the DIY space, um, you know, with manufacturers and then kind of across uh, different retailers. Um, there really is a, a huge opportunity now for brands to kind of take control um, and, you know, get out in front and build out their kind of e-commerce, you know, their, their strategy, but then uh, and also their, their presence across, you know, the various uh, marketing channels, you know. Um, however, like it can be um, because it is such a, a new space or, you know, not as uh, maybe mature as other kind of industries. And um, it can be quite hard for brands to, you know, properly understand and, and really identify who their target customer is and exactly what it is that they want. Um, in, in order to properly understand this, I think it's very important to, to understand what makes the consumer tick. Um, and there's a there's some key kind of numbers that we can really focus in here and like data points actually consider. And um, you can see on the on the on the screen here, you know, a, a Google study showed that around 47 percent, you know, of home improvement projects are done out of enjoyment rather than necessity. This shows a, a distinct difference in the DIY and home uh, consumer. They're looking to purchase or build something that, you know, is unique to them, you know, something that they're enjoying doing and using. Uh, these projects kind of uh, are going to be visible. They're present, you know, in their home um, for a, a, a long time to come. Um, because of this, you know, we, we are seeing that the DIY. Uh, sorry, actually, Chris, do you mind just going to onto the next slide there? Yeah. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, do you mind just sorry going back there? I just wanted to touch on the quality and price thing. Sorry, apologies for that. Um, and yeah, just this distinction between where we see with a lot of kind of our, our, our current or like more mature industries, uh, it can typically be a bit of a race at the bottom with regards to price. Um, with the DIY, uh, there is that distinction where they do enjoy it. Um, and what they're looking for more so is over the quality um, of the products that they're using and not necessarily to do with the price. You know, 71% are choosing or making the purchasing decision based on quality um, and only 29 are, are on price. Sorry, Chris, and then just on to the next one. And so this is uh, kind of leading us into um, what I really wanted to kind of knuckle down and focus on about how kind of DIY brands can actually, um, you know, get interest from, from these consumers. Um, and a large part of this is to do with kind of personalization. Um, like in other industries where we see, we do see that strong emphasis on quality rather than price. You know, you can almost guarantee that um, the ability to per, uh, like personalize is, is certainly a priority with DIYers. Um, the DIY and home consumers mindset is about much more than just doing you know projects on their own. They want to really make it their own project. Right? It's now easier than ever for you and I to get access to the same you know generic products. Um, but what we're starting to see through, you know, social media, blogs and platforms, you know, people are a lot more inclined to start sharing and talking about the cool, you know, interesting project products that they have found online. And um, people want to share what they're creating. Right. And um, if we look outside the DIY industry and um, we can start to see you can start to take, um, you know, examples of how brands can start to use this personalization. We're seeing brands like Nike, Puma, uh, Converse, you know, all giving consumers, you know, this ability to actually customize, you know, the look, the feel, the color, you know, of their particular trainer or, or shoe that they're buying. Um, and, and not only are they giving them the choice to do this, but, you know, we're seeing consumers being more than happy to actually pay a premium on, to, on top of just for this uh, this um, ability. So I don't see why DIY brands can start looking at something like this as well. Now, it is possible for a DIY brand to capitalize on this desire and personalize through a number of methods. Uh, a bit of thinking outside the box, offering custom options is, you know, is going to be a great way to get the DIY consumer interested in your brand. Um, another point to mention there as well, um, not necessarily on the actual product itself, more so um, you know, around you know, personalizing where the brand message is actually being consumed. Time and time again, you know, we're seeing consumers utilize different devices uh, for reading reviews, descriptions, you know, looking at images. Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the slide there, um, this coupled with the fact that like 82% of DIY shoppers, you know, even though we do see that growth in e-commerce or, or that trend towards going e-commerce, um, majority are still shopping in stores. You know, ensuring, if you can ensure that your website, you know, all your online materials, are all mobile compatible, it's going to be absolutely critical to ensure that consumers can access, you know, information about your about your brand um, and your products when and wherever they want. Um, this is something, you know, at Channel Site that we, we focused on in the last while. 
um, we think it's very, very important to kind of offer both the, you know, an online uh, store locator, um, but then equally offer that kind of offline store locator for each product. You know, it's crucial to give um, the consumer when they are ready to make the purchase, let them be able to kind of quickly identify, you know, exactly where the closest stockist is for them and where they can go and view uh, and ideally kind of ultimately complete that purchase uh, then and there. Do you mind moving on to the next slide, Chris, please? So um, with this one, it's we've kind of identified now roughly kind of what kind of consumer profile we're looking for. Um, and this is all about how we can actually get the consumer um, that consumer that we want to actually, you know, engage with our with our brand, our content, and be dropped onto, a, you know, a, a product detail page where they can start consuming even more information. Um, and I think it's I think it's quite key to note here, um, you know, uh, a, a big a big uh, you know area for growth here is going to be around, you know, what type of content uh, you're putting out. You know, if you look at the slide, around 88% of DIYers are saying, you know, they're watching how-to videos. Um, but then more impressively, you know, 65% of these people are saying that they're going to buy from brands that are actually producing this content. So by getting out in front, getting, you know, your name out there for all these these, these how-to videos, they're more likely to actually purchase uh, your product when they're in store or even buying online. Um, and I think this fits kind of exactly into, you know, what we already know you know, a bit regarding the power of video and, and platforms like YouTube in the modern world. You know, YouTube is the second biggest search engine, you know, after Google, it represents, a, you know, this represents a massive opportunity for brands to actually build their own following, but then to equally utilize any existing influencers that are already on the platform sharing content. Right. A strong presence, you know, on on YouTube increases your chances of being found by DIYers, you know, in search of ideas for their next project. Um, you were, look, always remember that your consumer, uh, the DIY consumers are enjoying what they do. So they are in search of the next project, the next thing they can do. They are looking for ways to be inspired, you know, using tutorial videos, videos from experts, um, any concept videos. These all represent a massive opportunity for brands, you know, in the digital landscape um, to capture that attention uh, and to ultimately kind of drive sales uh, for the brand. Um, I think on the next slide, uh, Chris, um, we have an, an example um, of where China site is kind of helping to do this. Um, so this is like a, a typical uh, YouTube video or shop of a video with content. Um, and, and what China site's looking to do here, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is basically capture this intent. So when they are engaging with your asset, whatever it might be, if it's social, if it's on YouTube, um, we can build out that call to action and connect that user directly through to you know that point of sale um, with their preferred vendor or preferred retailer. Um, this then allows us to kind of actually attribute that sale or that conversion to a particular campaign and kind of optimize that going forward. Um, and that's something I'll, I'll touch on later on. But I think, Chris, you have a little bit to go in on about product images and, and um, you know, especially around the kitchen faucet category, was it? That's right, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> So to, to add to what Mark uh, has said so far, uh, I thought we'd bring up some analysis that we conducted recently uh, on uh, product images. So using uh, Edge by Essential Digital Shelf, we've conducted an analysis on the kitchen faucet, faucets category, uh, specifically in the US uh, for Home Depot, Lowe's and Menards. Now, we've first summarized this by retail, as you can see here, and actually we found some surprising results. We were expecting so with something like kitchen faucets, which uh, tend to last about 15 years that uh, you know very long wearing product we're expecting them to be well represented uh, as you'd need that kind of content to convince, to convince a shopper um, as mark alluded to most people are still uh, 80 was it? i think it was 82 percent of people are still shopping or buying their uh, diy uh, products in store however a lot of people or an increasing number of people as he's kind of alluded to are, are using the online as almost a showroom uh, before going into store to, to buy so it, it's integral for the for these brands and retailers to have good content online and what we actually found here was that 71% of kitchen faucets on Menard's website had just one image. Now, that's very, that, was, that was very surprising. I mean, this is an important decision a shopper's going to make, especially if it's going to last for 15 years. Um, and product images are critical in convincing the shopper either to purchase this product uh, online or to, to even go into store to take a look at it. So we can see the, quite the difference between the two retailers here with 71% uh, uh, having just one image in Menard's and uh, compared to, say, 26% uh, for Home Depot. 
Now, if we actually have a look at uh, which brands had a low number of images to see who, who the real uh, offenders were, as they are, we're going to skip straight to the Menards, as we know they uh, the worst had, had the lowest figures. And we can see here at Kingston Brass, 99.3%, um, so basically almost their entire range, uh, had just one product image. And uh, other big names such as Moen and Delta had very similar issues, as you can see here, with around a 70% share. Uh, however, that's not to say some people aren't doing it right, uh, as we can see here with, uh, with Vigo. Um, all of its range uh, on the Menards website had at least five product images, which is significantly better than obviously everybody else. And when we move to Lowe's, we can see Kingston Brass again uh, has, has quite a high percentage of, of range with just one product image. Um, although this time, uh, Cola um, actually uh, performed uh, marginally worse. And, and interestingly, uh, while we saw Moen didn't perform particularly well on Menards, it, it did perform well um, on the Lowe's website. Um, in fact, it was the best of the brands that we uh, we analysed in this uh, this five five brand analysis. Now, finally, when we come to Home Depot, we see quite a shock. Kingston Brass, almost the best performer on the on the whole uh, of the five analysed, despite uh, poor performances in Lowe's and Menards. Um, and then we could also see Moen performing very well again, despite its performance on Menards as well. So, so what we're really seeing here is a uh, it's such an inc inconsistent picture across retailers. So. Brands such as Menards should be looking, sorry, brands such as, as Kingston Brass should be looking to, to, to equalize their, their content and reuse their content across all of these uh, retailers' sites. Because we can see it's been very inconsistent, not only with Kingston Brass, not only with Moen, but also with, with, with Delta. And they should look to really correct this uh, to help boost their conversion rates. Um, thanks. I'll, I'll hand back to you now, Mark. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Chris. Um, and, and that's, for, from our perspective anyway, that's definitely something that we, we see quite regularly. Um, brands that are putting a lot of time and energy into, you know, building out those product detail pages, you know, getting the right imagery, um, all this type of, as much information basically as you can provide across as many touch points as you can, is ultimately what's going to inform on, you know, how, much, how many conversions you are getting back. So, it, it, you know, it can seem like a lot of work uh, in the beginning to get all this stuff set up and, and, and a, a lot of kind of a bit of a time and money sink but over time and uh, like just generally you know over incrementally the, the sales that are going to be benefit from that is exactly what we want to see and um, so you know put the work in early and you'll, you'll see the benefits kind of in the long run um, and that kind of ties in a little bit about kind of you know what we're doing here at channel site but equally what we want to see you know brands doing you know to kind of start capturing more conversions um, across their own their own you know brands or own digital assets um, it is probably you know one of the most important steps along the funnel but equally it is often one of the most overlooked parts of the whole process how do we actually drive conversions right the hard work you know has almost already been done you you've created a strong consumer persona you've made aesthetically you know pleasing targeted content um but really the next step is to ask yourself you know how easy is it for consumers to actually buy my products online and this is especially paramount when there is no actual D2C store available. And then, you know, following on from that, you know, how much control do you have over this process, so this buying journey of the user? Um, at channel site, we certainly put a huge emphasis on ensuring that that consumer journey, you know, from uh, any digital asset, be that your brand site, you know, or a piece of content, um, you know, is directing them, you know, right onto that you know point of sale page uh, with a retailer and um, ensuring that that journey is quick it's seamless it's se as seamless as possible but equally we want to give uh, brands you know visibility into that journey so give brands exactly you know how much how many leads are traveling through to that that, that particular retailer um, and then how many sales are happening as a result of that and um, the last thing you know we want or a brand wants is to start losing consumers at that last hurdle you know, we see a lot of time, you know, energy, money being invested at this point, you know, but if a brand is relying on a user organically searching in Google for a place to purchase your items, you know, or to use a click and collect retailer, you're going to simply lose out on a large portion of them to competitive distraction. You know, as people are bidding on ads across all these different platforms, um, it's very hard to actually control that journey. Um, it's, and then again, of course, it's usually, as Chris mentioned, uh, usually important for brands to optimize the content on that site, you know, keeping consistency across the brand message. And um, this is what will ensure kind of people continue to complete their purchase as they go along. Um, and if you want to just onto the next slide there, Chris, please. 
so this um so i'm just going to kind of quickly touch on a little bit around kind of sales out data um and data that you can start using to actually inform your marketing as you go along um this is really the last step um to developing a, a strong e-commerce um strategy you know at channel site you know we make sure that all brands very clearly understand you know what marketing channel is performing the best but then we look to focus on exactly what channel isn't necessarily performing well you know be that industry standard or you know or across our own clients or across industry standard and um, with our basket insights we can actually inform a brand on whether or not um you know firstly a particular campaign was successful in terms of uh, not just leads but also revenue but then actually break that basket down and, and see what or not what what type of products were in the basket was it a branded item that was ultimately purchased through some con your your content or was it a competitor product or was it a, a similar brand item um you know or, or a complementary good for example um, and this sort of stuff starts becoming you know very powerful um when you can start to identify certain trends around particular product categories and we can start to see exactly which competitor products are being purchased over your product um, and then look in the retailer sites and, and figure out exactly kind of what's going on and seeing how we can use this data then to actually optimize you know your marketing going forward um, uh, and that's pretty much I'm gonna speak on regarding the data um, and Chris if you, you want to take over from here uh, I think I'll throw it back to Rob I believe Thanks, guys. Great insights. Um, we've now entered the Q&A portion of today's program. Um, and uh, again, all participants are on mute for the call. Um, but if you do have any questions, again, you can ask them by entering them in the panel on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, we only have time for a few uh, questions today just due to time constraints. But again, any that we can't get to um, live, uh, we'll make sure uh, to, uh, to follow up with you. And uh, at the conclusion of the, uh, of the webcast in the next couple of days, uh, we will make sure to, uh, to send everybody uh, the recording and uh, presentation deck uh, from today's uh, webcast. Uh, so the first question that came in, uh, I can take that. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, again, all uh, participants will receive a copy of this recording um, and presentation deck. So please, uh, please look out for that. Uh, we'll make sure to send that to you. Um, so thank you for that question. Uh, first question that came in, uh, Mark, for you. Uh, how have you seen the online retail shopping experience for the DIY category change in the last three to five years? And uh, and what are some key trends that you see uh, upcoming? Oh, yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, so definitely over the last three to five years, I think, you know, kind of touching on what Chris mentioned on myself earlier on around the types of content you're putting out. So, you know, very much focusing on that product detail page on the retailer, ensuring that, you know, you do have those, um, you know, as many images you can to kind of cover all angles um, and that, you know, all the content on there is matching everything you're putting out as well. That's certainly been a, an area that we've seen brands focus very much on over the last while um, is, is building that out. Um, in terms of where I kind of see the industry going, um, I guess, you know, it's kind of quite hard to actually look past kind of, you know, changes in technology over the last number of years. Um, you know, we've started seeing, you know, retailers like Ikea and then, you know, equally Amazon as well, um, start to utilize stuff like virtual reality. And um, so if we can, if brands can start to kind of think a bit about using, you know, these technologies to show consumers what the product is going to look like in their own home, you know, before they even actually buy it in the end, I think that's going to have a huge, huge benefit or, or impact on sales kind of going forward. Um, but yeah, very good question. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Chris, a uh, question that came in for you. Uh, what ways have you seen retailers like Lowe's and Home Depot improve the DIY shopping experience? Ah, right. Okay. Thank you for that question. Uh, <clears throat> well, a good online shopping experience, right? It's not just the responsibility of the retailer. It's a, it, it's a relationship between the retailer and the manufacturer. Um, so the retailer needs to be able to give the, the manufacturer the opportunity uh, and the ability to, to represent their product uh, to the best of their ability. Um, so from a basic perspective, there's obviously uh, multiple images, uh, uh, the ability to show clear, clear features and, and a description of the product. Uh, and one area sort of from a quality perspective that I've noticed over the last uh, year, maybe 18 months, that's really improved is the uh, the description from manufacturer section. Now, on, on many websites still, and, and in the past, this was maybe just a text field, uh, you know, outlining the product um, quite basically. Uh, if you go to some retailers, the section is now really comprehensive with, with product tours and videos and 
uh, and images and, and, and endorsements and even even user user photos that I bought uh, review photos. Um, so that's one area that's really really has improved and I think is very powerful to to help with conversion rates. Um, and actually, uh, I think it was about two weeks ago now uh, we heard from one of our clients that one area they were really investing in uh, and really looking at was uh, the 360 degree view image. Uh, so the user can then sort of rotate around the product and get to see it at all angles. Um, uh, you can see quite clearly how this would be like very beneficial in a category like kitchen faucets, something that's, you know, the design and look of the product. So if it's going to be there for 10 or 15 years, is very important. Um, uh, so I think that's a, that's an area um, that we've certainly seen seen a lot of growth in. I think we're going to see some uh, some short term growth in as well. Thanks, Chris. Uh, another question uh, that just came in, Chris, if you want to take this one as well. Um, we saw peaks in promotion over the Black uh, Friday weekend and holiday seasons. Um, when is the best time, in your opinion, to purchase a power tool? Oh, that's a broad question. OK. Um, well, certainly what we saw, I mean, we analyzed a six month period there and certainly the 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 early December, uh, the Black Friday weekend, they were certainly certainly peaks. So uh, that would have been the best time over the last six months. Um, certainly uh, the end of January, February was the, was a very, very bad time. So uh, apologies if anybody bought a drill then. Um, but it might not be across uh, across the whole period. No, I don't possibly. It, there are other, other key dates. So Father's Day in mid-June, that's always uh, traditionally seen uh, a lot of promotion. Um, uh, but we've also found last year that actually um, it kind of builds from promotions from about now so sort of April uh, leading to that kind of peak in Father's Day um, which makes sense right I mean a lot of a lot of the power tools uh, you might purchase uh, a lot of them either need to be or advised to be used outside um, and nobody really wants to go using a drill outside in, in minus two weather or I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit um, so that makes sense so we tend to, tend to see as the weather gets warmer spring spring you know winter goes into spring uh we tend to see for more promotions obviously chainsaws and lawnmowers that make that makes sense but also for, for more outdoor power tools so so the question really is uh, it depends what you're buying um but certainly uh there are kind of i would say two peaks april to june uh, and the black friday december period Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah, that uh, that's all the time uh, we have uh, for questions. So uh, again, thank you guys uh, for answering those and thank you everybody uh, for all the questions you posed. We had a, a strong influx of questions. Um, so thank you for your engagement. Um, and again, uh, any that we were not able to answer live today, uh, we will very much uh, make sure to follow back up with you uh, with our recommended uh, insight uh, to your question. Um, so now on your screen, you can see uh, ways to contact us uh, for here with Edge by Essential. Uh, as your organization continues to, to build out your strategies uh, for 2019 and beyond, uh, we can absolutely help you along that journey. Uh, you can contact us today um, by emailing the email address that's on your screen, info at essentialedge.com. Uh, you can also um, contact us by visiting our website at essentialedge.com, and uh, there is a uh, contact us um, section right at the top of the website uh, where you can reach us there as well. Uh, Mark, do you want to share with everybody the best way to get in touch with channel site? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess you can see on the, on the uh, screen there or on the, on the slide, um, you, you can go to channels, www.channelsite.com forward slash contact us and um, fill out a quick form and some will be able to, to answer any questions you have. You know, equally, if you want to get in touch with me directly, um, my email is mark, that's M-A-R-K dot Gilroy, that's G-I-L, or OY at channelsite.com. Yeah, and that's basically it. Thanks very much. Great. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, again, uh, Mark and Chris, thank you uh, for your time today. Um, your insights were terrific, and uh, we very much appreciate it. We hope everybody on the line um, really gained uh, additional insights into this market and uh, how you can be successful in the DIY category moving forward. Um, again, both of our organizations can very much help you along that journey. Um, uh, please contact us and, and we uh, will make sure to get back to you. Um, and again, thank you for everybody's time and uh, we look forward to uh, working with everybody in the future. Have a great day, everybody.